The Scene Society by Eric Fromm, Chapter 3, The Human Situation, The Key to Humanistic Psychoanalysis. The Human Situation. Man, in respect to his body and his physiological functions, belongs to the animal kingdom. The functioning of the animal is determined by instincts, by specific action patterns which are in turn determined by inherited neurological structures. The higher, an, the higher an animal is in the scale of development, the more flexibility of action pattern and the less completeness of structural adjustment do we find at birth. In the higher primates, we even find considerable intelligence, that is, use of thought for the accomplishment of desired goals, thus enabling the animal to go far beyond the instinctively prescribed action pattern. But great as the development within the animal kingdom is, certain basic elements of existence remain the same. The animal is lived through biological laws of nature. It is part of nature and never transcends it. It has no conscience of a moral nature and no awareness of itself and of its existence. It has no reason, if by reason we mean the ability to penetrate the surface grasped by the senses and to understand the essence behind that surface. Therefore, the animal has no concept of the truth, even though it may have an idea of what is useful. Animal existence is one of harmony between the animal and nature, not, of course, in the sense that the natural conditions do not often threaten the animal and force it to a bitter fight for survival, but in the sense that the animal is equipped by nature to cope with the very conditions it is to meet, just as the seed of a plant is equipped by nature to make use of the conditions of soil, climate, etc., to which it has become adapted in the evolutionary process. At a certain point of animal evolution, there occurred a unique break, comparable to the first emergence of matter, to the first emergence of life, and to the first emergence of animal existence. This new event happens when in the evolutionary process action ceases to be essentially determined by instinct, when the adaptation of nature loses its course of character, when action is no longer fixed by hereditarily given mechanisms, when the animal transcends nature, when it transcends the purely passive role of the creature, when it becomes, biologically speaking, the most helpless animal man is born. At this point, the animal has emancipated itself from nature by erect posture. The brain has grown far beyond what it was in the highest animal. This birth of man may have lasted for hundreds of thousands of years, but what matters is that a new species arose, transcending nature, that life became aware of itself. Self-awareness, reason, and imagination disrupt the harmony which characterizes animal existence. Their emergence has made man into an anomaly, into the freak of the universe. He is part of nature, subject to her physical laws and unable to change them, yet he transcends the rest of nature. He is set apart while being apart. He is homeless, yet chained to the home he shares with all creatures. Cast into this world at an accidental place and time, he is forced out of it again, uh, out of it again accidentally. Being aware of himself, he realizes his powerlessness and the limitations of his existence. He visualizes his own end, death. Never is he free from the dichotomy of his existence. He cannot rid himself of his mind, even if he should want to. He cannot rid himself of his body as long as he is alive and his body makes him want to be alive. Reason, man's blessing, is also his curse. It forces him to cope everlastingly with the task of solving an insoluble dichotomy. Human existence is different in this respect from that of all other organisms. It is in a state of constant and unavoidable dis disequilibrium. Man's life cannot be lived by repeating the pattern of his species. He must live. Man is the only animal that can be bored, that can feel evicted from paradise. Man is the only animal who finds his own existence a problem, which he has to solve and from which he cannot escape. 
He cannot go back to the pre-human state of harmony with nature. He must proceed to develop his reason until he becomes the master of nature and of himself. But man's birth ontogenetically as well as phylogenetically is essentially a negative event. He lacks the instinctive adaptation to nature. He lacks physical strength. He is the most helpless of all animals at birth and in need of protection for a much longer period of time than any of them. <clears throat> While he has lost the unity with nature, he has not been given the means to lead a new existence outside of nature. His reason is most rudimentary. He has no knowledge of nature's processes nor tools to replace the lost instincts. He lives divided into small groups with no knowledge of himself or of others. Indeed, the biblical paradise myth expresses the situation with perfect clarity. Man who lives in the Garden of Eden in complete harmony with nature but without awareness of himself begins his history by the first act of freedom, disobedience to a command. Concomitantly, he becomes aware of himself, of his separateness, of his helplessness. He is expelled from paradise, and two angels with fiery swords prevent his return. Man's evolution is based on the fact that he has lost his original home, nature, and that he can never return to it, can never become an animal again. There is only one way he can take to emerge, for, to emerge fully from his natural home, to find a new home one which he creates by making the world a human one and by becoming truly human himself. When man is born the human race as well as the individual, he is thrown out of a situation which was definite, as definite as the instincts, into a situation which is indefinite, uncertain, and open. There is, certainly, there is certainty only about the past and about the future as far as it is death which actually is return to the past, the inorganic state of matter. The problem of man's existence then is unique in the whole of nature. He has fallen out of nature, as it were, and is still in it. He is partly divine, partly animal, partly infinite, partly finite. The necessity to find ever new solutions for the contradictions in his existence, to find ever higher forms of unity with nature, his fellow men and, him, and himself, is the source of all psychic sources, uh, forces which motivate man, of all his passions, effects, and anxieties. The animal is content if its physiological needs, its hunger, its thirst, and its sexual needs are satisfied. And as much as man is also animal, these needs are likewise imperative and must be satisfied. But inasmuch as man is human, the satisfaction of these instinctual needs is not sufficient to make him happy. They are not even sufficient to make him sane. The archimedic point of the specifically human dynamism lies in this uniqueness of the human situation. The understanding of man's psyche must be based on the analysis of man's needs stemming from the conditions of his existence. The problem then, which the human race as well as each individual has to solve, is that of being born. Physical birth, if we think of the individual, is by no means as decisive and singular an act as it appears to be. It is indeed an important change from introterine and extra, or sorry, intrauterine into extrauterine life. But in many respects, the infant after birth is not different from the infant before birth. It cannot perceive things outside, cannot feed itself. It is completely dependent on the mother and would perish without her help. Actually, the process of birth continues. The child begins to recognize outside objects, to react effectively, to grasp things and to coordinate his movements, to walk. But birth continues, the child learns to speak, it learns to know the use and function of things, it learns to relate itself to others, to avoid punishment, and gain praise and liking. Slowly, the growing person learns to love, to develop reason, to look at the world objectively. He begins to develop his powers, to acquire a sense of identity, to overcome the seduction of his senses for the sake of an 
integrated life. Birth, then, in the conventional meaning of the word, is only the beginning of birth in the broader sense. The whole life of the individual is nothing but the process of giving birth to himself. Indeed, we should be fully born when we die, although it is the tragic fate of most individuals to die before they are born. From all we know about the evolution of the human race, the birth of man is to be understood in the same sense as the birth of the individual. When man has transcended a certain threshold of minimum instinctive adaptation, he ceased to be an animal. But he was as helpless and unequipped for human existence as the individual infant is at birth. The birth of man began with the first members of the species Homo sapiens, and human history is nothing but the whole process of this birth. It has taken man hundreds of thousands of years to take the first steps into human life. He went through a narcissistic phase of magic omnipotent orientation, through totemism, nature worship, until he arrived at the beginnings of the formation of conscience, objectivity, brotherly love. In the last 4,000 years of his history, he has developed visions of the fully born and fully awakened man, visions expressed in not two, two different ways, by the great teachers of man in Egypt, China, India, Palestine, Greece, and Mexico. The fact that man's birth is primarily a negative act, that of being thrown out of the original oneness with nature, that he cannot return to where he came from, implies that the process of birth is by no means an easy one. Each step into his new human existence is frightening. It always means to give up a secure state which was relatively known for one which is new, which one has not yet mastered. And undoubtedly, if the infant could think at the moment of the severance of the umbilical cord, he would experience the fear of dying. A loving fate protects us from this first panic. But at any new step, at any new stage of our birth, we are afraid again. We are never free from two conflicting tendencies, one to emerge from the womb, from the animal form of existence, into a more human existence, from bondage to freedom, another to return to the womb, to nature, to certainty and security. In the history of the individual and of the race, the progressive tendency has proven to be stronger, yet the phenomena of mental illness and the regression of the human race to positions apparently relinquished generations ago show the intense struggle which accompanies each new act of birth. Man's needs as they stem from the conditions of his existence. Man's life is determined by the inescapable alternative between regression and progression, between return to animal existence and arrival at human existence. Any attempt to return is painful. It inevitably, it inevitably leads to suffering and mental sickness, to death either physiologically or mentally, insanity. Every step forward is frightening and painful too, until a certain point has been reached where fear and doubt have only minor proportions. Aside from the, physiological nourished crave, or the physiologically nourished cravings, hunger, thirst, and sex, all essential human cravings are determined by this polarity. Man has to solve a problem. He can never rest in the given situation of a passive adaptation to nature. Even the most complete satisfaction of all his instinctive needs does not solve this human problem. His most intensive passions and needs are not those rooted in his body, but those rooted in the very peculiarity of his existence. There lies also the key to humanistic psychoanalysis. Freud, searching for the basic force which motivates human passions and desires, believed he had found it in the libido, but powerful as the sexual drive and all its der derivations are, they are by no means the most powerful forces within man and their frustration is not the cause of mental disturbance. The most powerful forces motivating man's behavior stem from the condition of his existence, the human situation. Man cannot live statically because his inner contradictions drive him to seek for an equilibrium, for a new harmony instead of the lost animal harmony with nature. After he has satisfied his animal needs, he is driven by his human needs. While his body tells him what to eat and what to avoid, his conscience ought to tell him which needs to cultivate and satisfy, and which needs to let wither and starve out. But hunger and appetite are functions of the body 
with which man is born. Conscience, while potentially present, requires the guidance of men and principles which develop only during the growth of culture. All passions and strivings of man are attempts to find an answer to his existence, or, as we may also say, they are an attempt to avoid insanity. It may be said in passing that the real problem of mental life is not why some people become insane, but rather why most avoid insanity. Both the mentally healthy and the neurotic are driven by the need to find an answer, the only difference being that one answer corresponds more to the total needs of man, and hence is more conducive to the unfolding of his powers and to his happiness than the other. All cultures provide for a pattern system in which certain solutions are predominant, hence certain strivings and satisfactions. Whether we deal with primitive religions, with theistic, sorry, with theistic or non-theistic religions, they are all attempts to give an answer to man's existential problem. The finest, as well as the, as well as the most barbaric cultures, have the same functions. The difference is only whether the answer given is better or worse. The deviate from the cultural pattern is just as much in search of an answer as his more well-adjusted brother. His answer may be better or worse than the one given by his culture. It is always another answer to the same fundamental question raised by human existence. In this sense, all cultures are religious, and every neurosis is a private form of religion, provided we mean by religion an attempt to answer the problem of human existence. Indeed, the tremendous energy in the forces producing mental illness, as well as those behind art and religion, could never be understood as an outcome of frustrated or sublimated physiological needs. They are attempts to solve the problem of being born human. All men are idealists and cannot help being idealists, provided we mean by idealism the striving for the satisfaction of needs which are specifically human and transcend the physiological needs of the organism. The difference is only that one idealism is a good and adequate solution, the other a bad and destructive one. The decision as to what is good and bad has to be made on the basis or has to be made on the basis of our knowledge of man's nature and the laws which govern its growth. What are these needs and passions stemming from the existence of man? A. Relatedness versus narcissism. Man is torn away from the primary union with nature which characterizes animal existence. Having at the same time reason and imagination, he is aware of his aloneness and separateness, of his powerlessness and ignorance, of the accidentalness of his birth and of his death. He could not face this state of being for a second if he could not find new ties with his fellow man which replaced the old ones, regulated by instincts. Even if all his physiological needs were satisfied, he would experience his state of aloneness and individuation as a prison from which he had to break out in order to retain his sanity. In fact, the insane person is the one who has completely failed to establish any kind of union and is imprisoned, even if he is not behind barred windows. The necessity to unite with other living beings to be related to them is an imperative needs on the fulfillment of which man's sanity depends. This need is behind all phenomena which constitute the whole gamut of intimate human relations, of all passions which are called love in the broadest sense of the word. There are several ways in which this union can be sought and achieved. Man can attempt to become one with the world by submission to a person, to a group, to an institution, to God. In this way, he transcends the separateness of his individual existence by becoming part of somebody or something bigger than himself, and experiences his, his identity in connection with the power to which he is submitted. Another possibility of overcoming separateness lies in the opposite direction. Man can try to unite himself with the world by having power over it, by making others a part of himself, and thus transcending his individual existence by domination. The common element in both submission and domination is the sym symbiotic nature of relatedness. Both persons involved have lost their integrity and freedom. They live on each other and from each other, satisfying their craving for closeness. 
yet suffering from the lack of inner strength and self-reliance which would require freedom and independence, and furthermore constantly threatened by the conscious or unconscious hostility which is bound to arise from the symbiotic relationship. The realization of the submissive, masochistic, or the domineering, sadistic passion never leads to satisfaction. They have a self-propelling dynamism, and because no amount of submission or domination or possession or fame is enough to give a sense of identity and union, more and more of it is sought. The ultimate result of these passions is defeat. It cannot be otherwise. While these passions aim at the establishment of a sense of union, they destroy the sense of integrity. The person driven by any one of these passions actually becomes dependent on others. Instead of developing his own individual being, he is dependent on those to whom he submits or whom he dominates. There is only one passion which satisfies man's need to unite himself with the world and to acquire at the same time a sense of integrity and individuality, and this is love. Love is union with somebody or something outside oneself under the condition of retaining the separateness and integrity of one's own self. It is an experience of sharing, of communion, which permits the full unfolding of one's own inner activity. The experience of love does away with the necessity of illusions. There is no need to inflate the image of the other person, or of myself, since the reality of active sharing and loving permits me to transcend my individualized existence, and at the same time to experience myself as the bearer of the active powers which constitute the act of loving. What matters is the particular quality of loving, not the object. Love is in the experience of human solidarity with our fellow creatures. It is in the erotic love of man and woman, in the love of the mother for the child, and also in the love for oneself as a human being. It is in the mystical experience of union. In the act of loving, I am one with all, and yet I am myself. A unique, separate, limited mortal human being. Indeed, out of the very polarity between separateness and union, love is born and reborn. Love is one aspect of what I have called the productive orientation, the active and creative relatedness of man to his fellow man, to himself, and to nature. In the realm of thought, this productive orientation is expressed in the proper grasp of the world by reason. In the realm of action, the productive orientation is expressed in productive work, the prototype of which is art and craftsmanship. In the realm of feeling, the productive orientation is expressed in love, which is the experience of union with another person, with all men, and with nature, under the condition of retaining one's sense of integrity and independence. In the experience of love, the paradox happens that two people become one and remain two at the same time. Love in this sense is never restricted to one person. If I can love only one person and nobody else, if my love for one person makes me more alienated, and distant from my fellow man, I may be attached to this person in any number of ways, yet I do not love. If I can say, I love you, I say, I love you in all of humanity, all that is alive, I love you and also myself. Self-love in this sense is the opposite of selfishness. The latter is actually a greedy concern with oneself which springs from and compensates for the lack of genuine love for oneself. Love, paradoxically, makes me more independent because it makes me stronger and happier, yet it makes me one with a loved person to the extent that individuality seems to be extinguished for the moment. In loving, I experience I am you, you the loved person, you the stranger, you everything alive. In the experience of love lies the only answer to being human, lies sanity. Productive love always implies a syndrome of attitudes, that of care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. If I love, I care. That is, I am actively concerned with the other person's growth and happiness. I am not a spectator. I am responsible. That is, I respond to his needs, to those he can express, and more so to those he cannot or does not express. I respect him. That is, according to the original meaning of re-spicier, I look at him as he is, objectively, and not distorted by my wishes and fears. 
I know him. I have penetrated through his surface to the core of his being and related myself to him from my core, from the center as against the periphery of my being. Productive love, when directed towards equals, may be called brotherly love. In motherly love, Hebrew rakimim from rakim womb, the relationship between the two persons involved is one of inequality. The child is helpless and dependent on the mother. In order to grow, it must become more and more independent until he does not need mother anymore. Thus, the mother-child relationship is paradoxical and, in a sense, tragic. It requires the most intense love on the mother's side, and yet this very love must help the child to grow away from the mother and to become fully independent. It is easy for any mother to love her child before this process of separation has begun, but it is the task in which most fail, to love the child and at the same time to let it go and to want to let it go. In erotic love, another drive is involved, that for fusion and union with another person. While brotherly love refers to all men and motherly love to the child and all those who are in need of our help, erotic love is directed to one person, normally of the opposite sex, with whom fusion and oneness is desired. Erotic love begins with separateness and ends in oneness. Motherly love begins with oneness and leads to separateness. If the need for fusion were realized in motherly love, it would mean destruction of the child as an independent being, since the child needs to emerge from his mother rather than to remain tied to her. If erotic love lacks brotherly love and is only motivated by the wish for fusion, it is sexual desire without love or the perversion of love as we find it in the sadistic and masochistic forms of love. One understands fully man's need to be related only if one considers the outcome of the failure of any kind of relatedness, if one appreciates the meaning of narcissism. The only reality the infant can experience is his own body and his needs, physiological needs and the need for warmth and affection. He has not yet the experience of I as separate from thou, <clears throat> he is still in a state of oneness with the world, but a oneness before the awakening of his sense of individuality and reality. The world outside exists only as so much food or so much warmth to be used for the satisfaction of his own needs, but not as something or somebody who is recognized realistically and objectively. This orientation has been named by Freud that of primary narcissism. In normal development, this state of narcissism is slowly overcome by a growing awareness of reality outside and by a correspondingly growing sense of I as differentiated from thou. This change occurs at first on the level of sensory perception, when things and people are perceived as different and specific entities a recognition which lays the foundation for the possibility of speech. To name things presupposes recognizing them as individual and separate entities. It takes much longer until the narcissistic state is overcome emotionally. For the child up to the age of seven or eight years, other people still exist mainly as means for the satisfaction of his needs. They are exchangeable inasmuch as they fulfill the function of satisfying these needs and it is only around the ages of between eight and nine years that another person is experienced in such a way that the child can begin to love, that is to say in H.S. Sullivan's formulation, to feel that the needs of another person are as important as his own. Primary narcissism is a normal phenomenon, conforming with the normal physiological and mental development of the child, but narcissism exists also in later stages of life secondary narcissism, according to Freud, if the growing child fails to develop the capacity for love or loses it again. Narcissism is the essence of all severe psychic pathology. For the narcissistically involved person, there is only one reality, that of his own thought processes, feelings, and needs. The world outside is not experienced or perceived objectively, i.e. as existing in its own terms, conditions, and needs. The most extreme form of narcissism is to be seen in all forms of, of insanity. 
The insane person has lost contact with the world. He is withdrawn into himself. He cannot experience reality, either physical or human reality as it is, but only is formed and determined by his own inner processes. He either does not react to the world outside, or if he does, reacts not in terms of its reality, but only in terms of his own processes of thought and feeling. Narcissism is the opposite pole to objectivity, reason, and love. The fact that utter failure to relate oneself to the world is insanity points to the other fact, that some form of relatedness is the condition for any kind of sane living. But, but among the various forms of relatedness, only the productive one, love, fulfills the condition of allowing one to retain one's freedom and integrity while being at the same time united with one's fellow man. B. Transcendence, creativeness versus destructiveness. Another aspect of the human situation closely connected with the need for relatedness is man's situation as a creature and his need to transcend this very state of the passive creature. Man is thrown into this world without his knowledge, consent, or will, and he is removed from it again without his consent or will. In this respect, he is not different from the animal, from the plants, or from inorganic matter. But being endowed with reason and imagination, he cannot be content with the passive role of the creature, with the role of dice cast out of a cup. He is driven by the urge to transcend the role of the creature, the accidentalness and passivity of his existence, by becoming a creator. Man can create life. This is the miraculous quality which he indeed shares with all living beings, but with the difference that he alone is aware of being created and of being a creator. Man can create life, or rather a woman can create life by giving birth to a child and by caring for the child until it is sufficiently grown to take care of his own needs. Man, man and woman, can create by planting seeds, by producing material objects, by creating art, by creating ideas, by loving one another. In the act of creation, man transcends himself as a creature, raises himself beyond the passivity and accidentalness of his existence, into the realm of pur purposefulness and freedom. In man's need for transcendence lies one of the roots for love, as well as for art, religion, and material production. To create presupposes activity and care. It presupposes love for that which one creates. How then does man solve the problem of transcending himself if he is not capable of creating, if he cannot love? There's another answer to this need for transcendence. If I cannot create life, I can destroy it. To destroy life makes me also transcend it. Indeed, that man can destroy life is just as miraculous a feat as that he can create it, for life is the miracle, the inexplicable. In the act of destruction, man sets himself above life. He transcends himself as a creature. Thus, the ultimate choice for man, inasmuch as he is driven to transcend himself, is to create or to destroy to love or to hate. The enormous power of the will for destruction which we see in the history of man, and which we have witnessed so frightfully in our own time, is rooted in the nature of man, just as the drive to create is rooted in it. To say that man is capable of developing his primary potentiality for love and reason does not imply the naive belief in man's goodness. Destructiveness is a secondary potentiality rooted in the very existence of man and having the same intensity and power as any passion can have. But, and this is the essential point of my argument, it is only the alternative to creativeness. Creation and destruction, love and hate, are not two instincts which exist independently. They are both answers to the same need for transcendence, and the will to destroy must rise when the will to create cannot be satisfied. However, the satisfaction of the need to create leads to happiness, Destru destructiveness to suffering, most of all for the destroyer himself. <coughs> C. Rootedness, brotherliness versus incest. Man's birth as man means the beginning of his emergence from his natural home, the beginning of the severance of his natural ties. Yet this very severance is frightening. If man loses his natural roots, where is he and who is he? 
he would stand alone without a home, without roots. He could not bear the isolation and helplessness of this position. He would become insane. He can dispense with the natural roots only insofar as he finds new human roots, and only after he has found them can he feel at home again in this world. Is it surprising then to find a deep craving in man not to sever the natural ties, to fight against being torn away from nature, from mother, blood, and soil? The most elementary of the natural ties is the tie of the child to, to the mother. The child begins life in the mother's womb and exists there for a much longer time than it is the case with most animals. Even after birth, the child remains physically helpless and completely dependent on the mother. This period of helplessness and dependence, again, is much more protracted than with any, than with any animal. In the first years of life, no full separation between child and mother has occurred. The satisfaction of all his physiological needs, of his vital need for warmth and affection, depend on her. She has not only given birth to him, but she continues to give life to him. Her care is not dependent on anything the child does for her, on any obligation which the child has to fulfill. It is unconditional. Sometimes. She cares because the new creature is her child. The child, in these decisive first years of his life, has the experience of his mother as the fountain of life, as an all-enveloping, protective, nourishing power. Mother is food. She is love. She is warmth. She is earth. To be loved by her means to be alive, to be rooted, to be at home. Just as birth means to leave the enveloping protection of the womb, Growing up means to leave the protective orbit of the mother. Yet even in the mature adult, the longing for this situation as it once existed never ceases completely, in spite of the fact that there is indeed a great difference between the adult and the child. The adult has the means to stand on his own feet, to take care of himself, to be responsible for himself and even for others, while the child is not yet capable of doing all this. But considering the increased perplexities of life, the fragmentary nature of our knowledge, the accidentalness of adult existence, the unavoidable errors we make, the situation of the adult is by no means as different from that of the child as it generally assumed. Every adult is in need of help, of warmth, of protection, in many ways differing and yet in many ways similar to the needs of the child. Is it surprising to find in the average adult a, a deep longing for the security and rootedness which, which the relationship to his mother once gave him? Is it not to be expected that he cannot give up this intense longing unless he finds other ways of being rooted? In psychopathology, we find ample evidence for his phenomenon of the refusal to leave the all-enveloping orbit of the mother. In the most extreme form, we find the craving to return to the mother's womb. A person completely obsessed by this desire may offer the picture of schizophrenia. He feels and acts like the fetus in the mother's womb, incapable of assuming even the most elementary functions of a small child. In many of the more severe neuroses, we find the same craving, but as a repressed desire manifested only in dreams, symptoms, and neurotic behavior, which results from the conflict between the deep desire to stay in the mother's womb and the adult part of the personality which tends to live a normal life. In dreams, this craving appears in symbols, like being in a dark cave, and in one man, a submarine, diving into deep water, etc. In the behavior of such a person, we find a fear of life and a deep fascination for death. Death and fantasy being the return to the womb, to Mother Earth. The less severe form of the fixation to Mother is to be found in those cases where a person has permitted himself to be born, as it were, but where he is afraid to take the next step of birth, to be weaned from mother's breasts. People who have become stuck at this stage of birth have a deep craving to be mothered, nursed, protected by a motherly figure. They are the eternally dependent ones, who are frightened and insecure when motherly protection is withdrawn, but optimistic and active when a loving mother or mother substitute is provided, either realistically or in fantasy. These pathological phenomena in individual life have their parallel in the evolution of the human race. 
The clearest expression of this lies in the fact of the universality of the incest taboo, which we find even in the most primitive societies. The incest taboo is the necessary condition for all human development, not because of its sexual, but because of, it, because of its affective aspect. Man, in order to be born, in order to progress, has to sever the umbilical cord. He has to overcome the deep craving to remain tied to mother. The incestuous desire has its strength not from the sexual attraction to mother, but from the deep-seated craving to remain in or to return to the all-enveloping womb, or to the all-nourishing breasts. The incest taboo is nothing else but the two cherubim with fiery swords, guarding the entrance to paradise and preventing man from returning to the pre-individual existence of oneness with nature. The problem of incest, however, is not restricted to fixation to the mother. The tie to her is only the most elementary form of all natural ties of blood, which give man a sense of rootedness and belonging. The ties of blood are extended to those who are blood relatives, whatever the system is according to which such relationships are established. The family and the clan, and later on the state, nation, or church, assume the same function with the individual which the individual mother had originally for the child. The individual leans on them, feels rooted in them, has his intense or has his sense of identity as a part of them, and not as an individual apart from them. <clears throat> the person who does not belong to the same clan is considered as alien and dangerous, as not sharing in the same human qualities which only the own clan possesses. The fixation to the mother was recognized by Freud as the crucial problem of human development, both of the race and of the individual. In accordance with his system, he explained the intensity of the fixation to the mother as derived from the little boy's sexual attraction to her, as the expression of the incestuous striving inherent in man's nature. He assumed that the fixation's perpetuation in later life resulted from the continuing sexual desire. By relating this assumption to his observations of the son's opposition to the father, he reconciled assumption and observation into a most ingenious explanation. We need to get off. Oh, sorry. My cat is gross. I lost my spot. <clears throat> He assumed that the fixation's perpetuation in later life resulted from the continuing sexual desire. By relating this assumption to his observations of the son's opposition to the father, he reconciled assumption and observation into a most ingenious explanation, that of the Oedipus complex. He explained hostility to the father as a result of sexual rivalry with him. But while Freud saw the tremendous importance of the fixation to the mother, he emasculated his discovery by the peculiar interpretation he gave to it. He projects into the little boy the sexual feeling of the adult man, the little boy having, as Freud recognized, sexual desires, was supposed to be sexually attracted to the woman closest to him, and only by the superior power of the rival in this triangle is he forced to give up his desire without ever recovering fully from this frustration. Freud's theory is a curiously rationalistic interpretation <clears throat> of the observable facts. <clears throat> In putting the emphasis on the sexual aspect of the incestuous desire, Freud explains the boy's desire as something rational in itself and evades the real problem, the depth, the, the depth and intensity of the irrational affective tie to the mother, the wish to return into her orbit, to remain a part of her, the fear of emerging fully from her. In Freud's explanation, the incestuous wish cannot be fulfilled because of the presence of the father rival, while in reality the incestuous wish is in contrast to all requirements of adult life. Thus, the theory of the Oedipus complex is at the same time the acknowledgement and the denial of the crucial phenomenon. Man's longing for mother's love. In giving the incestuous striving paramount significance, the importance of the tie with mother is recognized. By explaining it as sexual, the emotional and true meaning of the tie is denied. Whenever fixation to the mother is also sexual, and this undoubtedly happens, 
It is because the effect of fixation is so strong that it, that it also influences the sexual desire, but not because the sexual desire is at the root of the fixation. <clears throat> On the contrary, sexual desire as such is notoriously fickle with regard to its, obje its objects, and generally sexual desire is precisely the force which helps the adolescence or the adolescent in his separation from mother and not the one which binds him to her where we find that the intense attachment to mother has changed this normal function of the sexual drive two possibilities must be considered one is that the sexual desire for mother is a defense against the desire to return to the womb the latter leads to insanity or death while the sexual desire is at least compatible with life one is saved from the fear of the threatening womb by the nearer to life fantasy to entering the vagina with the appropriate or of entering the vagina with the appropriate organ. The other possibility to be considered is that the fantasy of sexual intercourse with the mother does not have the quality of adult male sexuality, that of voluntary pleasurable activity, but that of passivity, of being conquered and possessed by the mother, even in the sexual sphere. Aside from these two possibilities, which are indicative of more severe pathology, we find instances of sexual incestuous wishes which are stimulated by a seductive mother, and although expressive of mother, of mother fixation, less indicative of severe pathology. That Freud himself distorted his great discovery may have been due to an unsolved problem in the relationship to his own mother, but it was certainly largely influenced by the strictly patriarchal attitude which was so characteristic of Freud's time, and which he shared so completely. The mother was dethroned from her paramount place as the object of love, and her place was given to the father, who was believed to be the most important figure in the child's affections. It sounds almost unbelievable today, when the patriarchal basis has lost much of its strength, to read the following statement written by Freud. I could not point to any need in childhood as strong as that for a father's protection. Similarly, he wrote in 1908, referring to the death of his father, that the father's death is the most important event, the most poignant loss in a man's life. Thus, Freud gives the father the place which in reality is that of the mother, and degrades the mother into the object of sexual lust. The goddess, the goddess is transformed into the prostitute, the father elevated to the central figure of the universe. There was another genius living a generation before Freud who saw the central role of the tie to the mother in the development of man, Johann Jacob Bakufin. Because he was not narrowed down by the rationalistic sexual interpretation of the fixation to the mother, he could see the facts more profoundly and more objectively. In his theory of the matriarchal society, he assumed that mankind went through a stage preceding that of the patriarchate, where the ties to the mother as well as those to blood and soil were the paramount form of relatedness, both individually and socially. In this form of social organization, as was pointed out above, the mother was the central figure in the family, in social life, and in religion. Even though many of Bakufin's historical constructions are not tenable, there can be no doubt that he uncovered a form of social organization and a psychological structure which had been ignored by psychologists and anthropologists. Because, from their patriarchal orientation, the idea of a society ruled by women rather than by men was just absurd. Yet there is a great deal of evidence that Greece and India, before the invasion from the north, had cultures of a matriarchal structure. The great number and the significance of mother goddesses points in the same direction. <clears throat> Venus of Will Willendorf, mother goddess at Mohango Daro, Isis, Istar, Rhea, Sibyl, Hathor, the serpent goddess at Nippur, the Akkadian water goddess Ai, Demeter, and the Indian goddess Kali, the giver and destroyer of life, are only a few examples. Even in many contemporary primitive societies, we can see remnants of the matriarchal structure in matrilineal, matrilineal forms of consang consanguity. Sorry, consanguinity of matril local forms of marriage. More significantly, we can find many examples of the matriarchal kind of relatedness to mother, blood, and soil 
even where the social forms are not matriarchal anymore. While Freud saw in the incestuous fixation only a negative pathogenic element, Bakufin saw clearly both the negative and the positive aspects of the attachment to the mother figure. The positive aspect is a sense of affirmation of life, freedom, and equality, which pervades the matriarchal structure. Inasmuch as men are children of, of nature, the children of mothers, they are all equal, have the same rights and claims, and the only value that counts is that of life. To put it differently, the mother loves her children not because one is better than the other, not because one fulfills her expectations more than the other, but because they are her children, and in that quality they are all alike and have the same right to love and care. The negative aspect of the matriarchal structure was also clearly seen by Bakufin. By being bound to nature, to blood and soil, man is blocked from developing his individuality and his reason. He remains a child and incapable of progress. Bakufin gave an equally broad and profound interpretation of the role of the father, again pointing out both the positive and negative aspects of the fatherly function. Paraphrasing Bakufin's ideas and somewhat enlarging on them, I would say that man not equipped to create children, I'm speaking here of course of the experience of pregnancy and birth, and not of the purely rational knowledge that the male sperm is necessary for the creation of a child not charged with the task of nursing and taking care of them, is more remote from nature than woman. Because he is less rooted in nature, he is forced to develop his reason, to build up a man-made world of ideas, principles, and man-made things which replace nature as a ground of existence and security. The relationship of the child to the father does not have the same intensity as that to the mother, because the father never has the all-enveloping, all-protective, all-loving role which the mother has for the first years of the child's life. On the contrary, in all patriarchal societies, the relationship of the son to the father is one of submission on the one hand, but of rebellion on the other, and this contains in itself a permanent element of dissolution. The submission to the father is different from the fixation to the mother. The latter is a continuation of the natural tie of the fixation to nature. The former is man-made, artificial, based on power and law and therefore less compelling and forceful than the tie to the mother. While the mother represents nature and unconditioned love, the father represents abstraction, conscience, duty, law, and hierarchy. The father's love for the son is not like the unconditioned love of the mother for her children, because they are her children, but it is the love for the son whom he likes best because he lives up most to his expectations and is best equipped to become the heir to the father's property and worldly functions. From this follows an important difference between motherly and fatherly love. In the relationship to mother, there is little the child can do to regulate or control it. Motherly love is like an act of grace. If it is there, it is a blessing. If it is not there, it cannot be created. Here lies the reason why individuals who have not overcome the fixation to mother often try to procure motherly love in a neurotic, magical way by making themselves helpless sick or by regressing emotionally to the stage of an infant. The magic idea is, if I make myself into a helpless child, mother is bound to appear and to take care of me. The relationship to father, on the other hand, can be controlled. He wants the son to grow up, to take responsibility, to think, to build, or, and, to be obedient, to serve father, to be like him. Whether father's expectations are more on development or on obedience, the son has a chance to acquire father's love, to produce father's affection by doing the desired things. To sum up, the positive aspects of the patriarchal complex are reason, discipline, conscience, and individualism. The negative aspects are hierarchy, oppression, inequality, submission. It is of special significance to note the close connection between the fatherly and motherly figures, and moral principles. Freud, in his concept of the superego, relates only the father figure to the development of conscience. He assumed that the little boy, frightened by the castration threat of the rival father, incorporates the male parent, or rather his commands and prohibitions, into the formation of a conscience. But there is not only a fatherly, but also a motherly conscience. There is a voice which tells us to do our duty, and a voice which tells us to love and to forgive. 
others as well as ourselves. It is true that both types of conscience are originally influenced by the fatherly and motherly figures, but in the process of maturing, the conscience becomes more and more independent from these original father and mother figures. We become, as it were, our own father and our own mother, and we become also our own child. The father within ourselves tells us, this you ought to do, and that you ought not to do. If we have done the wrong thing, he scolds us, and if we have done the right thing, he praises us. But while the father in us speaks in this manner, the mother in us speaks in a very different language. It is as if she were saying, your father is quite right in scolding you, but do not take him too seriously. Whatever you have done, you are my child, I love you, and I forgive you. Nothing you have done can interfere with your claim to life and happiness. Fathers and mothers' voices speak a different language. In fact, they seem to say opposite things. Yet the contradiction between the principle of duty and the principle of love, of fatherly and motherly conscience, is a contradiction inherent in human existence, and both sides of the contradiction must be accepted. The conscience which follows only the commands of duty is as distorted as a conscience which follows only the commands of love. The inner father's and the inner mother's voices speak not only with regard to man's attitude toward himself, but also toward all his fellow men. He may judge his fellow man with his fatherly conscience, but he must at the same time hear in himself his voice of the mother, or the voice of the... What the fuck? But he must at the same time hear in himself the voice of the mother, who feels love for all fellow creatures, for all that is alive, and who forgives all transgressions. Before I continue the discussion of man's basic needs, I want to give a brief description of the various phases of rootedness as they can be observed in the history of mankind, even though this exposition interrupts somewhat the main line of thought of this chapter. While the infant is rooted in mother, man, in his historical infancy, which is still by far the largest part of history in terms of time, remains rooted in nature. Though having emerged from nature, the natural, ro the natural world remains his home. Here are still his roots. He tries to find security, regressing to and identifying himself with nature, the world of plants and animals. This attempt to hold on to nature can be clearly seen in many primitive myths and religious rituals. When man worships trees and animals as his idols, he worships particularizations of nature. They are the protecting powerful forces whose worship is the worship of nature itself. In relating himself to them, the individual finds his sense of identity and belonging as part of nature. The same holds true for the relationship to the soil on which one lives. The tribe often is not only unified by the common blood, but also by the common soil. And this very combination of blood and soil gives it its strength as the real home and frame of orientation for the individual. <clears throat> In this phase of human evolution, man still feels himself as part of the natural world, that of animals and plants. Only when he has taken the decisive step to emerge fully from nature does he try to create a definite demarcation line between himself and the animal world. An illustration of this idea can be found in the belief of the Winnebago Indians, that in the beginning the creatures did not yet have any permanent form. All were a kind of neutral being which could transform itself into either man or animal. At a certain period, they decided to evolve definitely into animal or into man. Since that time, animals have remained animals, and man has remained man. This same idea is expressed in the Aztec belief that the world before the era in which we live now was only populated by animals, until with, until with Quetzalcoatl, uh, the era of human beings emerged, the same feeling is expressed in the belief still to be found among some Mexican Indians that a certain animal corresponds to one particular person. Mexican Indian is definitely not the correct term here. But, you know. Or in the belief of the Maoris that a certain tree planted at birth corresponds to one individual. 
It is expressed in the many rituals in which man identifies himself with an animal by garbing himself as one or in the selection of an animal totem. This passive relationship to nature corresponded to man's economic activities. He started out as a food gatherer and hunter. And were it not for primitive tools and the use of fire, he could be said to differ but little from the animal. In the process of history, his skills grew and his relationship to nature is transformed from a passive into an active one. He develops animal husbandry, learns to cult cultivate the land, achieves, achieves an ever-increasing skill in art and craftsmanship, exchanges his products for those of foreign countries, and thus becomes a traveler and trader. His gods change correspondingly. As long as he feels largely identified with nature, his gods are part of nature. When his skills as an artisan grow, he builds idols out of stone or wood or gold. When he has evolved still further and gained a greater feeling of his own strength, his gods have the shape of human beings. At first, and this seems to correspond to an agricultural stage, God appears to him in the form of the all-protecting and all-nourishing Great Mother. Eventually, he begins to worship fatherly gods, representing reason, principles, laws. This last and decisive turn away from rootedness in nature and from dependence on a loving mother seems to have begun with the emergence of the great rational and patriarchal religions. In Egypt, with the religious revolution of Ikhnaton in the 14th century BC, in Palestine, with the formation of the Mosaic religion around the same time, in India and Greece, with the arrival of the northern invaders not much later, Many rituals express this new idea. In the sacrifice of animals, the animal is ma in man is sacrificed to God. In the biblical food taboo, which forbids eating the blood of the animal because the blood is its life, a strict demarcation line is put between man and animal. In the concept of God, who represents the unifying principle of all life, who is, un who is invisible and unlimited, the opposite pole to the natural, finite, diversified world, to the world of things, has been established. Man, created in God's likeness, shares God's qualities. He emerges from nature and strives to be fully born, to be fully awake. This process reached a further stage in the middle of the first millennium in China. <clears throat> with Confucius and Lao Tse. In India with Buddha in Greece with the philosophers of the Greek Enlightenment, and in Palestine with the biblical prophets, and then a new peak with, with Christianity and Stoicism within the Roman Empire, with Quetzalcoatl in Mexico, and another half millennium later with Muhammad in Africa. <clears throat> Our Western culture is built on two foundations, the Jewish and the Greek cultures, Considering the Jewish tradition, the foundations of which are laid down in the Old Testament, we find that it constitutes a relatively pure form of patriarchal culture, built upon the power of the father and the family, of the priest and king in society, and of a fatherly God in heaven. However, in spite of this extreme form of patriarchalism, one can still recognize the older matriarchal elements as they existed in the earth and nature-bound Telluric religions which were defeated by the rational patriarchal religions during the second millennium BC. In the story of creation, we find man still in a primitive unity with the soil, without the necessity to work, and without consciousness of himself. The woman is the more intelligent, active, and daring of the two, and only after the fall, the patriarchal god announces the principle that man shall rule over woman. The entire Old Testament is an elaboration of the patriarchal principle in various ways by the establishment of a hierarchical pattern of a the theocratic state and a strictly patriarchal family organization. In the family structure as described by the Old Testament, we find always the figure of the favorite son, Abel as against Cain, Jacob as against Esau, Joseph against his brothers, and in a broader sense, the people of Israel as the favorite son of God. Instead of the equality of all children in the eyes of the mother, we find the favorite, who is most like the father, and most liked by the father as his successor, and as the heir to his property. 
In the fight for the position of the favorite son, and thus for the inheritance, the brothers turn into enemies. Equality gives way to hierarchy. The Old Testament postulates not only a strict taboo of incest, but also a prohibition of the fixation to the soil. Human history is described as beginning with the expulsion of man from paradise, from the soil in which he was rooted, and with which he felt one. Jewish history is described as beginning with the command to Abraham to lead the country in which he was born, or to leave the country in which he was born. Oh. And to go to a country which thou knowest not. From Palestine the tribe wanders to Egypt. From there again it returns to Palestine. But the new settlement is not final either. The teachings of the prophets are directed against the new incestuous involvement with the soil and nature as it was manifest in Canaanitic idolatry. They proclaim the principle that a people who has regressed from the principles of reason and justice to those of the incestuous tie to the soil will be driven away from its soil and will wander in the world homeless and soilless until it has fully developed the principles of reason until it has overcome the incestuous tie to the soil and nature. Only then can the people return to their homeland. Only then will the soil be a blessing, a human home freed from the curse of incest. The concept of the messianic time is that of the complete victory over the incestuous ties, and the full establishment of the spiritual reality of moral and intellectual conscience, not only among the Jews, but among all peoples of the earth. The crowning and central concept of the patriarchal development of the Old Testament lies, of course, in the concept of God. He represents the unifying principle behind the manifoldness of phenomena. Of phenomena. Man is created in the likeness of God, hence all men are equal, equal in their common spiritual qualities, in their common reason, and in their capacity for brotherly love. <clears throat> Early Christianity is a further development of the spirit, not so much in the emphasis on the idea of love, which we find expressed in many parts of the Old Testament, but by its emphasis on the supranational character of religion. As the prophets challenged the validity of the existence of their own state, because it did not live up to the demands of conscience, so the early Christians challenged the moral legitimacy of the Roman Empire, because it violated the principles of love and justice. While the Jewish Christian tradition emphasized the moral aspect, Greek thought found its most creative expression in the intellectual aspect of the patriarchal spirit. In Greece, as in Palestine, we find a patriarchal world which, in both its social and religious aspects, had victoriously emerged from an early matriarchal structure. Just as... Just as... Oh, fuck... Just as Eve was not born from a woman, but made from Adam's rib, so Athena was not a child of a woman, but came from Zeus's head. The remainder of an older matriarchal world can still be seen, as Bacchifin has shown, in the figures of goddesses which are subordinate to the patriarchal Olympic world. The Greeks laid the foundation for the intellectual development of the Western world. They laid down the first principles of scientific thought, were the first to build theory as a foundation of science, to develop a systematic philosophy as it had not existed in any culture before. <clears throat> they created a theory of the state and of society based on their experience of the Greek polis, to be continued in Rome on the social basis of a vast unified empire. On account of the incapacity of the Roman Empire to continue, a progressive social and political evolution. The development came to a standstill around the 4th century, but not before a new powerful institution had been built, the Catholic Church. While earlier Christianity had been a spiritually revolutionary movement of the poor and disinherited who questioned the moral legitimacy of the existing state. Um, the faith of a minority which accepted persecution and death as God's witnesses. It was to change in an incredibly short time into the official religion of the Roman state. While the Roman Empire's social structure was slowly freezing into a feudal order, 
that was to survive in Europe for a thousand years, the Catholic religion's social structure began to change too. The prophetic attitude that encouraged the questioning and criticizing of secular powers violation of the principles of love and justice receded in importance. The new attitude called for indiscriminating support of, of the church's power as an institution. Such psychological satisfaction was given to the masses that they accepted their dependence and poverty with resignation, making little effort to improve their social condition. The most important change from the standpoint of this discussion is that of a shifting of emphasis from a purely patriarchal to a blending between matriarchal and patriarchal elements. The Jewish God of the Old Testament had been a strictly patriarchal God. In the, in the Catholic development, the idea of the all-loving and all-forgiving mother is reintroduced. The Catholic Church herself, the all-embracing mother and the Virgin Mother, symbolized the maternal spirit of forgiveness and love. While well, God the Father represented in the hierarchical principle the authority to which man had to submit without complaining or rebelling. No doubt this blending of fatherly and motherly elements was one of the main factors to which the church owed its tremendous attraction and influence over the minds of the people. The masses oppressed by patriarchal authorities could turn to the loving mother who would comfort them and intercede for them. The historical function of the church was by no means only that of helping to establish a feudal order. Its most important achievement, greatly helped by the Arabs and Jews, was to transmit the essential elements of Jewish and Greek thought to the primitive culture of Europe. It is as if Western history had stood still for about a thousand years to wait for the moment when Northern Europe had been brought to the point of development at which the Mediterranean world had arrived at the beginning of the Dark Ages. When the spiritual heritage of Athens and Jer Jerusalem had been transmitted to and had saturated the northern European peoples, the frozen social structure began to thaw and an explosive social and spiritual development began again. The Catholic theology in the 13th and 14th centuries, the ideas of the Italian Renaissance, discovering the individual in nature, the concepts of humanism and of natural law and the Reformation are the foundations of the new development. The most drastic and most far-reaching effect on European and world development was that of the Reformation. Protestantism and Calvinism went back to the purely patriarchal spirit of the Old Testament and eliminated the mother element from the religious concept. Man was not any more enveloped by the motherly love of the Church and the Virgin. He was alone. Facing the severe and strict God whose mercy he could obtain only by an act of complete surrender. The princes and the state became all-powerful, sanctioned by the demands of God. The emancipation from feudal bonds led to the increased feeling of isolation and powerlessness. But at the same time, the positive aspect of the paternal principle asserted itself in the renaissance of rational thought and individualism. The renaissance of the patriarchal spirit since the 16th century, especially in Protestant countries, shows both the positive and negative aspects of patriarchism. The negative aspect man manifested itself in a new submission to the state and temporal power, to the ever-increasing importance of man-made laws and secular hierarchies. The positive aspect showed itself in the increasing spirit of rationality and objectivity and in the growth of individual and social conscience. The flowering of science in our day is one of the most impressive manifestations of rational thought the human race has ever produced. But the matriarchal complex in both its positive and negative aspects has by no means disappeared from the modern Western scene. Its positive aspect... <clears throat> its positive aspect... Sorry, looks like I lost my spot again. Its positive aspect, the idea of human equality, the sacredness of life, of all men's right to share in the fruits of nature, found expression in the ideas of natural law, humanism, enlightenment philosophy, and the objectives of democratic socialism. Common to all these ideas is the concept that all men are children of Mother Earth 
and have a right to be nourished by her and to enjoy happiness without having to provide this right by the achievement by, of any particular status. The brotherhood of all men implies that they are all the sons of the same mother, who have an inalienable right to love and happiness. In this concept, the incestuous tie to the mother is eliminated by the mastery over nature as it manifests itself in industrial production. Man frees himself from his fixation to the bonds of blood and soil. He humanizes nature and naturalizes himself. But side by side with the development of the positive aspects of the matriarchal complex, we find in the European development the persistence of or even further regression to its ne negative aspects, the fixation to blood and soil. Man, freed from the traditional bonds of the medieval community, afraid of the new freedom which transformed him into an isolated atom, escaped into a new idol idol idolatry of blood and soil, of which nationalism and racism are the two most evident expressions, along with the progressive development, which is a blending of the positive aspect of both patriarchal and matriarchal spirit, went the, de went the development of the negative aspects of both principles. The worship of the state blended with the idolatry of the race or nation. Fascism, Nazism, and Stalinism are the most drastic manifestations of this blend of state and clan worship, both principles embodied in the figure of a Führer. But the new totalitarianisms are by no means the only manifestations of incestuous fixation on our, in our time. The breakdown of the Catholic supranational world of the Middle Ages would have led to a higher form of Catholicism, that is, of human universalism, overcoming clan worship. Had the development followed the intentions of the spiritual leaders of humanist thought since the Renaissance, but while science and technique created the conditions for such development, the Western world fell, ba fell back into new forms of clan idolatry, that very orientation which the prophets of the Old Testament and early Christianity tried to uproot. Nationalism, originally a progressive movement, replaced the bonds of feudalism and absolutism. The average man today obtains his sense of identity from his belonging to a nation, rather than from his being a son of man. His objectivity, that is, his reason, is warped by this fixation. He judges the stranger with different criteria than the members of his own clan. His feelings toward the stranger are equally warped. Those who are not familiar by bonds of blood and soil, expressed by common language, customs, food, songs, etc., are looked upon with suspicion, and paranoid delusions about them can spring up at the slightest provocation. This incestuous fixation not only poisons the relationship of the individual to the stranger, but to the members of his own clan and to himself. The person who has not freed himself from the ties to blood and soil is not yet fully born as a human being. His capacity for love and reason are crippled. He does not experience himself nor his fellow man in their and his own human reality. Nationalism is our form of incest, is our idolatry, is our insanity. Patriotism is its cult. It should hardly be necessary to say that by patriotism I mean that attitude which puts the own nation above humanity, above the principles of truth and justice not the loving interest in one's own nation, which is the concern with the nation's spiritual as much as with its material welfare, never with its power over other nations. Just as love, just as love for one individual which excludes the love for others is not love, love for one's country which is not part of one's love for humanity is not love, but idolatrous worship. The idolatrous character of national feeling can be seen in the reaction to the violations of clan symbols, a reaction which is very different from that to the violation of religious or moral symbols. Let us picture a man who takes the flag of his country to a street of one of the cities of the Western world and tramples on it in, a view, in view of other people. He would be lucky not to be lynched. Almost everybody would feel a sense of furious indignation, which hardly permits of any objective thought. The man who desecrated the flag would have done something unspeakable. He would have committed a crime which is not one crime among others, but the crime, the one unforgivable and unpardonable. 
not quite as drastic but nevertheless qualitatively the same would be the reaction to a man who says i do not love my country or in the case of war do not care for my country's victory such a sentence is a real sacrilege and a man saying it becomes a monster an outlaw in the feelings of his fellow men in order to understand the particular quality of the feeling aroused we may compare this reaction to one which would occur if a man got up and said i am in favor of killing <clears throat> all black people or all jewish people i am in favor of starting a war in order to conquer new territory indeed most people would feel that this was an unethical inhuman opinion but the crucial point is that the particular feeling of an uncontrollable deep-seated indignation and rage would not occur such an opinion is just bad but it is not a sacrilege it is not an attack against the sacred Even if a man should speak disparagingly of God, he would hardly arouse the same feeling of indignation as against the crime, against the sacrilege, which is the violation of the symbols of the country. It is easy to rationalize the reaction to a violation of the national symbols by saying that a man who does not respect his country shows a lack of human solidarity and of social feeling. But is this not true also of the man who advocates war? or the killing of innocent people, or who exploits others for his own advantage. Undo undoubtedly, a lack of concern for one's own country is an expression of a lack of social responsibility and of human solidarity, as are the other acts mentioned here. But the reaction to the violation of the flag is fundamentally different from the reaction to the denial of social responsibility in all other aspects. The one object is sacred, a symbol of clan worship. The others are not. After the great European revolutions of the 17th and 18th centuries failed to transform freedom from into freedom to, nationalism and state worship became the symptoms of a regression to incestuous fixation. Only when man succeeds in developing his reason and love further than he has done so far, only when he can build a world based on human solidarity and justice, only when he can feel rooted in the experience of universal brotherliness, Will he have found a new human form of rootedness? Will he have transformed his world into a truly human home? D. Sense of identity. Individuality versus herd conformity. Man may be defined as the animal that can say I, that can be aware of himself as a separate entity. The animal being within nature and not transcending it has no awareness of himself and has no need for a sense of identity. Man, being torn away from nature, being endowed with reason and imagination, needs to form a concept of himself, needs to say and to feel, I am I. Because he has not lived, but lives, because he has lost the original unity with nature, has to make decisions, is aware of himself and of his neighbor as different persons, he must be able to sense himself as the subject of his actions. As with the need for relatedness, rootedness, and transcendence, this need for a sense of identity is so vital and imperative that man could not remain sane if he did not find some way of satisfying it. Man's sense of identity develops in the process of emerging from the primary bonds which tie him to mother and nature. The infant, still feeling one with mother, cannot say I, nor has he any need for it. Only after he is conceived of the outer world as being separate and different from himself does he come to the awareness of himself as a distinct being, and one of the last words he learns to use is I in reference to himself. In the development of the human race, the degree to which man is aware of himself as a separate self depends on the extent to which he has emerged from the clan and the extent to which the process of individuation has developed. The member of a primitive clan might express his sense of identity in the formula, I am we. He cannot yet conceive of himself as an individual, existing apart from his group. In the medieval world, the individual was identified with his social role in the feudal hierarchy. The peasant was not a man who happened to be a peasant. The feudal lord, not a man who happened to be a feudal lord. He was a peasant or a lord, and the sense of his unalterable station was an essential part of his sense of identity. When the feudal system broke down, the sense of identity was shaken, and the acute question, who am I, arose. Or more precisely, how do I know what I am? Or, that, or how, how do I know that I am? 
This is the question which was raised in a philosophical form by Descartes. He answered the quest for identity. He answered the quest for identity by saying, I doubt, hence I think, I think, hence I am. This answer put all the emphasis on the experience of I as the subject of any thinking activity and failed to see that the I is experienced also in the process of feeling and creative action. The development of Western culture went in, in the direction of creating the basis for the full experience of individuality. By making the individual free politically and economically, by teaching him to think for himself and freeing him from an authoritarian pressure, one hoped to enable him to feel I in the sense that he was sent the center and active subject of his powers, and experienced himself as such. But only a minority achieved the new experience of I. For the majority, individualism was not much more than a facade behind which was hidden the failure to acquire an individual, individual sense of identity. Many substitutes for a truly individual sense of identity were sought for and found. Nation, religion, class, and occupation served to furnish a sense of identity. I am an American, I am a Protestant, I am a businessman, are the formulae which help a man experience a sense of identity after the original clan identity has disappeared and before a truly individual sense of identity has been acquired. These different identifications are, in contemporary society, usually employed together. They are, in a broad sense, status identifications, and they are more efficient if blended with older feudal remnants, as in European countries. In the United States, in which so little is left of feudal relics, in which there is so much social mobility, these status identifications are naturally less efficient, and the sense of identity is shifted more and more to the experience of conformity. Inasmuch as I am not different, inasmuch as I am like the others and recognized by them as a regular fellow, I can sense myself as I. I am as you desire me, as Pirandello put it in the title of one of his plays, Instead of the pre-individualist, individualistic clan identity, a new herd identity develops in which the sense of identity rests on the sense of an unquestionable belonging to the crowd. That this uniformity and conformity are often not recognized as such and are covered by the illusion of individuality does not alter the facts. The problem of the sense of identity is not, as it is usually understood, merely a philosophical problem or a problem only concerning our mind and thought. The need to feel a sense of identity stems from the very condition of human existence, and it is the source of the most intense strivings. Since I cannot remain sane without the sense of I, I s sorry, since I cannot remain sane without the sense of I, I am driven to do almost anything to acquire this sense. Behind the intense passion for status and conformity is this very need, and it is sometimes even stronger than the need for physical survival. What could be more obvious than the fact that people are willing to risk their lives, to give up their love, to surrender their freedom, to sacrifice their own thoughts for the sake of being one of the herd, of conforming, and thus of acquiring a sense of identity, even though it is an illusory one? E. The need for a frame of orientation and devotion. Reason versus irrationality. The fact that man has reason and imagination leads not only to the necessity for having a sense of his own identity, but also for orienting himself in the world intellectually. This need can be compared with the process of physical orientation, which develops in the first years of life, and which is completed when the child can walk by himself, touch and handle things, knowing what they are. But when the ability to walk and speak has been acquired, only the first step in the direction of orientation has been taken. Man finds himself surrounded by many puzzling phenomena, and, having reason, he has to make sense of them, has to put them in some context which he can understand and which permits him to deal with them in his thoughts. The further his reason develops, the more adequate becomes his system of orientation, that is, the more it approximates reality. But even if man's frame of orientation is utterly illusory, it satisfies his need for some picture which is meaningful to him. Whether he believes in the power of a totem animal, in a rain god, or in the superiority and destiny of his race, his need for some frame of orientation is satisfied. Quite obviously, the picture of the world which he has depends on the development of his reason and of his knowledge. 
although biologically the brain capacity of the human race has remained the same for thousands of generations. It takes a long evolutionary process to arrive at objectivity, that is, to acquire the faculty to see the world, nature, other persons, and oneself as they are, and not distorted by desires and fears. The more man develops this objectivity, the more he is in touch with reality, the more he matures, the better can he create a human world in which he is at home. Reason is man's faculty for grasping the world by thought, in contradiction to intelligence, which is man's ability to manipulate the world with the help of thought. Reason is man's instrument for arriving at the truth. Intelligence is man's instrument for manipulating the world more successfully. The former is essentially human. The latter belongs to the animal part of man. Reason is a faculty which must be practiced in order to develop, and it is indivisible. For this I mean that the faculty for objectivity refers to the knowledge of nature as well, as to the knowledge of man, of society, and of oneself. If one lives in illusions about one sector of life, one's capacity for reason is restricted or damaged, and thus the use of reason is inhibited with regard to all other sectors. Reason in this respect is like love, just as love is an orientation which refers to all objects, and is incompatible with the restriction to one object. So is reason a human faculty which must embrace the whole of the world with which man is confronted. The need for a frame of orientation exists on two levels. The first and the more fundamental need is to have some frame of orientation, regardless of whether it is true or false. Unless man has such a subjectively satisfactory frame of orientation, he cannot live sanely. At the second level, the need is to be in touch with reality by reason, to grasp the world objectively. But the necessity to, de to develop his reason is not as immediate as that to develop some frame of orientation, since what is at stake for man in the latter case is his happiness and serenity, and not his sanity. This becomes very clear if we study the function of rationalization. However unreasonable or immoral an action may be, man has an insuperable urge to rationalize it. That is, to prove to himself and to others that his action is determined by reason, common sense, or at least conventional morality. He has little difficulty in acting irrationally, but it is almost impossible for him not to give his action the appearance of reasonable motivation. <clears throat> if man were only a disembodied intellect, his aim would be achieved by a comprehensive thought system. But, but since he is an entity endowed with a body as well as a mind, he has to react to the, to the dichotomy of his existence, not only in thinking, but in the total process of living, in his feelings and actions. Hence, any satisfying system of orientation contains not only intellectual elements, but elements of feeling and sensing, which are expressed in the relationship to an object of devotion. The answer is given to man's need for a system of orientation and an object of devotion differ widely, both in content and in form. There are primitive systems such as animism and totemism in which natural objects or ancestors represent answers to man's quest for meaning. <clears throat> there are non-theistic systems like Buddhism, which are usually called religions, although in their original form there is no concept of God. There are purely philosophical systems like Stoicism, and there are the monotheistic religions or religious systems which give an answer to man's quest for meaning in reference to the concept of God. But whatever their contents, they all respond to man's need to have not only some thought system, but also an object of, devo of devolution, or sorry, devotion, which gives meaning to his existence and to his position in the world. Only the only the anal only the analysis of the various forms of religion can show which answers are better and which are worse solutions to man's quest for meaning and devotion, better or worse always considered from the standpoint of man's nature and his development. <clears throat>